We got chat. Hello, 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 ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Um, we've got a another wonderful Wednesday webinar with a bit of one of the legends of uh, Lambeth and Froome, uh, my old friend uh, Shane Collins, who has been running like myself eco projects for uh, thirty plus years um, in many locations, from uh, London to the Green Gathering to to Froome. Uh, absolute legend, uh, relentless person, uh, on, <laughs> similar to myself, keep networking and set up many projects along the way. If you haven't checked out the Green Gathering, go. Um, Shane is going to be talking to us about um, movement uh, and, and strategies, strategies for movement. He's been involved, like myself, with the past seven or eight waves of the environmental movement since the early days of the uh, road protest and uh, uh, Reclaim the Streets and Freedom Network and uh, the Campaign Against the Criminal Justice Act and uh, many campaigns right up to the present day. So uh, without too much further ado, uh, the man, the legend, the one and only, Shane <laughs> Collins, take it away. Phoenix, thank you very much and uh, evening all. Um, so yeah, got quite a bit to go through tonight. Um, what I want to try and outline very quickly is just the, the sort of systemic problems we've got um, with uh, with our system of capitalism uh briefly look at the things to change but mainly look at how we the sort of strategies for change if you like um so that's uh, a barking dog um uh so this just gives i take it you can all see that oh sure so yeah we can see that sorry about that um you can see that so we'll start off just whizzing through the sort of systemic problems with uh with with capitalism. I mean, I think we all probably know this uh, finite resource. You can't have a, a continually growing economy um, on a world of finite resources. Um, and obviously, every company has sort of quarterly business reports, annual accounts, and if they don't make enough growth and profit then they lose their share price and they sort of disappear um uh inequality um you know obviously the world now is probably more unequal than it was at the time of the pharaohs um and it looks like with sort of a, a web-based economy some people will continue to get incredibly wealthy um and uh, and the disparities will grow and obviously when disparities in in economics grow within a community you you don't trust each other quite so much um you know there, there's sort of jealousies and why they got more than me and and it sort of happens that most jobs these days that that uh, do bad to the planet pay very well and most jobs that are good for society um, the things we need, the welfare state or what's left of it, uh, don't pay very well. Um, but the, the main problem uh, we're facing in terms of sort of an existential crisis is obviously pollution. Um, and that's uh, pollution from um, <clears throat> well, mainly fossil fuels. Um, and, you know, we're all very aware of this. Uh, I'll just give you a quick sort of a weather forecast. Um, we're now at 1.2 degrees uh, temperature increase. Um, obviously, that's an average over the sea. It's less. And over the land, it's more. So, for example, say in Europe last year and um, Southern Europe and parts of Western United States, there was actually a 1.5 degree increase. Um, in parts of the Arctic, uh, it was about a three or four degree increase. Um, it looks like we're going to crash through 1.5 degrees by 2030 quite easily. Um, and then by mid 2030s, NAO, NOAA reckon about 2034, the summer Arctic ice sheet will disappear. Um, and obviously that means that, you know, we all remember the albedo effect from geography lessons, the sunlight, the sun's sunshine won't be reflected off a white ice sheet. It will be taken, the, the heat energy will be taken in by a darker ocean, um, which means that the ocean will continue to heat up a bit more. Um, and it will mean that the winter ice takes longer to reform 
Um, and obviously the big problem with a warming Arctic is methane hydrates. Um, these are methane that are sort of locked in a hydrate, a sort of crystallized form of methane um, on the floor of the Arctic Ocean, in particular the East Siberian shelf, the sort of Laptev Sea, where it's only about 50, 70 meters deep. Um, so when the methane starts bubbling up, which it does when there's a change in pressure, when there's a change in heat, um, there's not enough time for bacteria in the ocean to eat the methane, which you might might happen in very deep water. Um, so the big worry is that an awful lot of methane will start escaping from the Arctic um, come the 2030s. Um, looking further ahead, sort of 2050, uh, Sir David King, um, the ex-government chief scientist, is suggesting that by 2050, much of the rice growing areas of, um, actually I'll take this off for a moment. Let's just stop share. Um, much of the rice growing areas in, uh, in sort of Southern China, Southeast Asia um, will have uh, an infusion of salt water. Um, I know the tide sea is obviously rising about three or four millimeters a year at the moment. So by 2050, most of those areas, Indonesia um, or parts of Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, southern China, will simply cease to be able to grow um, to grow rice. Um, so rice will probably cease to become a, an internationally tradable commodity. Uh, that will probably affect, David King estimates, about two or three hundred million people who will have to move. Um, we can look at two degrees centigrade in sort of 20 to 30 years time. So, you know, 2040s, 20 early 2050s. Um, and then by 2070, uh, Professor Tim Lenton from Exeter University, who is a, a brilliant climatologist, um, is suggesting that by 2070, those sort of North, those sort of latitudes encompassing the Middle East, Northern Africa, Northern India, Southern United States, um, they will have so many days over 40 degrees centigrade that crops simply won't be able to grow. So if you think of that latitude across the world, sort of, as I say, Middle East, North Africa, Northern India, uh, they will cease to become arable by 2017 unless we make big changes um and professor tim lenton's estimating that's about 1.2 billion people um and they can't all live in air conditioned cities you know they will move um and then we're looking at two and a half degrees by about 30 to 60 years um and three degrees you know at the earliest sort of 40 years um, but I have to say all these IPCC models have tended to, well, what's been happening has been happening quicker than the models dared to forecast. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I hope I've outlined the, the magnitude of the problem that is facing us um, in the next you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and, uh, and this is not a secret. You know, the, the oil companies, the oil business, I don't know if you saw Big Oil versus the world, but the oil companies did excellent research on this in the late 70s, early 80s. The Exxon climatologists in particular were, to give them credit, they were spot on. Um, what they forecast then has come to be. Um, of course, the oil companies hid that information. They deployed greenwashing uh, individual responsibility for your emissions, um, shale gas fracking as sort of a, a greener, less carbon intensive. Um, and we've got to the stage where we are now where we certainly won't stick below 1.2 degrees if, if there is a, a, a massive turnaround, that sort of society changing turnaround, similar to what we saw in COVID, say, um, we don't really stand much chance of getting below two degrees unless we can really get some change in quick. <laughs> um, so I hope I've outlined what might be a fairly shit future. 
Um, our job is to make it less shit, really. Um, I don't think there's any other way of putting it. So let's move straight on to um, how we can change things. Um, and let's just share that screen there. Um, so this is just going through a, a few different ways that groups in the past have uh, have caused social change, really. Um, so starting off with consumer choice, uh, you know, if you think of your money as being your daily vote and who do you vote for every day, do you vote for a sort of green economy um, or do you vote for an online corporate economy? Um, and uh, that has a, a, an effect in so many areas. Uh, we looked briefly at, um, uh, let's just find it now, I can't find it. Uh, we looked briefly at, at the, the sort of basic things, um, food, uh, energy, housing, media, money. You know, these all have fairly clear um, consumer choices. Um, so, yeah, and consumer choice, it, it 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 can be very effective. Um, I, I would argue that it's it's often not effective on its own, or rather, it's more effective with other strategies being used as well. But th there's no doubt, you know, we do have some individual ability and responsibility here. Okay, a quick hands up here. Uh, who has uh, solar panels on their roof? One, two, oh wait, I've got to change my view. I can't see gallery. Uh, we're on to, yeah, that's what can I see? Sort of one, two, three, yeah, maybe half. Um, and who has a, who has a um, renewable energy supplier? Yes, that looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. I mean, that, those are fairly basic stuff that we can all do. Um, and, and similarly, on the food side, there's a very clear choice between buying chemical based food from a supermarket with long food miles um, versus the local organic veg box scheme that's delivered on a bicycle, which we're very lucky to have in Froome and, and there are increasingly in, in many other parts of the country. But it does need us to support them. Um, the second uh way of, of sort of uh it's gonna mute anyone i think carry on show no um the, the second way is sort of campaign groups um so you know whether that's a a, a, a local friends of the earth group greenpeace xr just stop oil green party ramblers fence repair you know, whatever it is, it and whatever the campaign, one of the main things about campaign groups is community cohesion. You know, it's bunches of people getting together and forming networks because we know that when the shit hits the fan, uh, you're much better in a network of sort of like-minded people with a multitude of, of, of skills. Um, as opposed to just being your own sort of individual off in a corner, hoping it's going to be all right. Um, so these campaigns you know, allow us to build up social capital. Um, and, uh, and you know, they can be successful. Um, thinking of what should we look at, say, uh, apartheid in South Africa. Um, numerous campaign groups, the anti-apartheid um, campaign groups, um, allied with consumer choice and consumer boycotts you know we don't buy south african oranges all that sort of thing um so uh, both of those ha had an effect the campaign groups were very good at getting publicity and making sure people knew about it um uh and then you know obviously within south africa the 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 anc um took different routes but after you know at first they were very much peaceful protest non-violent direct action uh big demonstrations but then after sharpville in 1962 when the south african army just started shooting people um 
the ANC decided it wasn't really very responsible to ask people to become targets in the street. Um, and so they changed tactics. Uh, they, they sort of thought about guerrilla warfare, but didn't have the training or the weapons. Um, so they went for sabotage, um, damage to property, um, in particular, the sort of South African infrastructure, um, the electricity and the oil and those sort of things. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that economically weakened the apartheid governments. Um, and then along with consumer boycotts of South African goods, um, increasing uh, campaign groups and protests and pressure. And, uh, you know, eventually the whole thing came tumbling down um, and there was at last elections and, uh, and a democratic government elected. Um, so I think the relevant point with that is that it's not one thing that makes a difference. It's not just us deciding to solely buy green goods and electricity and services. Um, it's not us solely focusing just on elections or just on campaigning. It's it's recognising that all these things have a part to play and and it's probable when more parts are playing that we're more likely to achieve success um and uh you know moving on to elections um you know obviously in this country we you know it takes an electoral system to hold the greens back um it's worth comparing the first european elections in 1989 um, which were not held under PR in this country, but they were held under PR in the rest of Europe. Um, the Greens in 1989 European elections got 15%. We had an amazing, incredibly high turnout and vote. Uh, and we got no M MEPs at all because it was first past the post. Compare to Germany, where the Greens got 12% vote, but because it was PR, they got, I think it was about 20 or 30 MEPs, and that really kick-started the German Green Party as an electoral force. And obviously since then, they've been in, in uh, coalition with the SDP twice, first in the 90s with Schroeder. Um, and the price of their coalition then was treating uh, Gaulite as guest workers, Turks, giving them uh, German nationality, getting rid of nuclear power, which led to Germany leading the way in renewables um, and treating heroin as a, as a crime issue. I mean, sorry, as a health issue instead of a crime issue. Um, so those were the, the things that the Greens were able to um, screw out of the SDP as part of that coalition. Um, and, and similarly now, um, they're in coalition again um, and although things have been completely messed up by the Ukraine war there, they are still greening their economy um, in, in a pretty impressive way. Um, let's move on to, uh, to protest. Um, so that, that sort of, this covers a, a fair few things really. Um, everything from a sort of A to B march um, which uh, has, has been the sort of traditional uh, protest, if you like. Um, strikes, you know, trade union strikes, this sort of thing. Um, Nonviolent direct action, road protests. Um, and I suppose, uh, I mean, Kings North was, was a, a, an interesting example of, of uh, different strategies being used. Um, you know, it, just going back to 2008, when the then Labour government was about to unleash a whole new generation of 11 coal-fired power stations. Um, I mean, th this is an interesting story because at the moment, the, the, the one thing Britain is doing quite well and is constantly crowed about by the Conservative government is that <laughs> since the 1990s, our overall um, emissions have dropped about 40%. Um, why? Because we've moved away from coal. Um, and, uh, and and yeah, so Kings North Labour government about to bring in 11 new coal-fired power stations. There was a huge amount of campaigning against it. 
Um, there was the uh, Camp for Climate Action occupation of the area around Kings North Power Station in Kent. Um, we blockaded it from the River Medway and from the land. Um, and we were there for a week and got loads of uh, very good publicity. Um, and that put a lot of pressure on Labour. Um, and so Ed Miliband, the then Environment Secretary, came up with this deal whereby you could only have a new coal-fired power station if it was 25% carbon capture and storage. And that obviously killed the whole thing, because although carbon capture and storage has been around as an idea for decades, um, it, it still can't be efficiently proven to work at scale. It operates on one small power station in Canada, and it causes about a 15 to 20% drop in efficiency. Um, but, you know, we've got to remember the whole net zero um, idea is based on the BECs, essentially, biomass, energy, carbon capture and storage. So the idea is that we carry on polluting a little bit less now, but we still carry on polluting. Um, and we will plant lots of trees and invent carbon capture and storage, or at least the next generation will. And in 20, 30 years time, they'll suck out all these greenhouse gases, which we are now emitting. Um, so, you know, I would argue net, net, net zero is a very convenient policy for uh, the establishment, the economic elite to carry on polluting now with the hope that trees might mature in time or carbon capture and storage might be efficiently invented. Um, but, uh, but you know, Kings North was a victory. Uh, we did stop a new generation of coal-fired power stations. Um, and so, you know, that was a, a mixture of, of protest um, and, and campaign groups and obviously consumer choice as well because nobody wanted to buy Eon's electricity. Um, moving on to the three and a half percent rule. Um, so the three and a half percent rule is based on research by uh, MIT research called Erica Chenoweth. Um, and she basically studied uh, revolutions since the Second World War um, and tried to figure out what made revolutions succeed or fail. Um, and their conclusion was that if you could get three and a half percent of the population peacefully demonstrating in the capital city, in the, the main square in the capital city and staying there, um, then the police will often overreact. That will get the sympathy of the other 20, 30, 40 percent of the population who were sympathetic, but working, looking after the kids, busy at the time, whatever and draw them into the movement. And once you've got that sort of dynamic of people, that number of people, um, quite often either governments fall or they change their policies. Um, so that in a nutshell is the three and a half percent rule, um, which is roughly the sort of rule that Extinction Rebellion and Insulate Britain and Just Stop Oil have sort of been trying to follow to you know, get popular protest, get people out in the street. Um, the government then generally uh, uh, overreacts um, and, uh, and and more people come out. Um, and so that's sort of moving into civil resistance, which, you know, also I think represents what Just Stop Oil are doing. They're basically saying, sod the consequences. What we're doing is illegal. We'll do it accountably. You can arrest us. You can fling us in jail. Um, but at some stage, the jails will get full up and you will become uh, so unpopular as a government for jailing peaceful protesters that that opinion will shift. <clears throat> um, that is uh, in marked contrast to the radical flank idea. Um, did people see that Chris Packham documentary on the uh, on the TV the other night? Um very interesting, well worth watching on Channel 4, um, basically Chris Packham asking, should he break the law? Um, so the radical flank view, which has been primarily um, put about by uh, a Swiss activist uh, called Andreas Malm, um, 
and he wrote uh, a, a pretty amazing book called How to Blow Up a Pipeline, um, which is not a, a DIY book, but it's basically looking at a, a lot of the, the campaigns and revolutions that Erica Chenoweth looked at in the 3.5% rule, but pointing out that actually they weren't all that peaceful. There was always a radical flank, a, a, a leading edge, a, a slightly more um, iffy edge, if you like. Um, and uh, and if there was that radical flank, then he argues that the government or the policymakers, um, because of the slightly frightening radical flank, he argues that the policymakers often will take the compromise, go for the the uh, less extreme groups. Um, so, you know, if you think the Green Party was seen as sort of fairly extremist and radical when, when you know, in the 80s and early 90s, um, now with the advent of lots of other campaigning groups of Extinction Rebellion or just up all, Green Party is seen as much more moderate um, and some green policies are being taken up by governments and other parties, but very much the... Uh, the easy greenwash ones. Um, but if you look at, we talked about apartheid earlier on, um, you know, th there was the uh, the ANC, Umkonto Wisawese's armed wing um, blowing up infrastructure. Uh, there was the PAC, the Pan-African Congress, who were much more about armed struggle. Um, so in the end, the, uh, the, the, the apartheid government thought, shit, you know, this looks pretty hairy let's release mandela and uh and and go for elections um similarly the civil rights movement in in the united states um the the kennedy's administration was faced with you know martin luther king uh peaceful direct action you know taking gandhi's sort of uh example um versus more riots in in black ghettos in most cities versus you know black panthers um and and as well as white panthers and various other groups um and and malcolm x um and so the kennedy administration decided to go for the sort of martin luther king peaceful option because they didn't want to risk more and more riots um so i i think th those are a couple of examples where um the, the sort of radical flank idea may well have a point. Um, you know, liberty is not sort of asked for, you generally have to fight for it. Um, not literally, but sometimes. Um, and so what Andreas Malm um, is arguing that in lots of these past uh campaigns there was that radical flank and and he similarly obviously talks about the suffragists and the suffragettes um we now sort of laud the suffragettes for uh getting the vote and being peaceful and lovely but obviously that the, the general public don't know is that there were numerous 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 windows in white halls smashed um women going on hunger strike and being force fed um jumping in front of horses is probably the one thing we do know but you know government ministers holiday houses were burnt down um there was a a, a lot of um damage to property um let's say and some of it accountable some of it unaccountable but andreas malm is very much arguing that uh that the economic damage to property is what companies and corporations and governments understand. Um, and so, you know, he's arguing that should happen more. And um, I guess just looking back on the road protest in the 90s, which was uh, another big victory, um, we should remember that you know, it, it was campaigning groups, it was protests, um, but there was also a, a certain amount of, um, well, a need for a lot of security, let's say, at Twyford <laughs> Town, at Newbury and at M11. And I think by the end of M11, it, it, they reckoned it was about 11 million quid on security. 
Um, and certainly on Twyford Down, if uh, any digger was unfortunate to be found on its own, um, you know, salt in the petrol tank, sand in the oil tank, um, these sort of things were very frequently happening because the idea was to make the cost of building these bloody motorways um, as high as possible to stop the government doing it again. And so whilst we lost the battle at Twyford, we lost at M11, we lost at Newbury, but then the government gave up. Um, yeah, we actually won that one, wasn't it, Shane? It was £26 billion pound road building programme cut down to £8 billion. So although, like you say, they say we lost in a few locations, we set up camps up and down the country and two thirds of these roads were never built. So two thirds of those sites of scientific interest and beautiful woods were saved in the future. Yeah. Direct action yeah, gets we, results. Yeah. we lost a few battles, but we did win the war. And, you know, it, it's the same with genetically modified food. Um, On that one. When, when Reclaim the Streets um, sort of disbanded uh, or got spied on and couldn't really carry on, uh, quite a few people went into anti-GM campaigning. Um, and uh, dra uh, picking crops, pulling up test crops, um, as well as the campaigning and the protest, uh, we don't have GM food in the shops. That was a another really big victory uh, when you compare it to a lot of other countries which do. I mean, obviously, feedstock here can still be genetically modified. Um, so... It's not ideal, but at least we don't have GM food in uh, in in the in in our food chain at the moment, or what we directly eat. Um, so yes, that sort of damage to property definitely has an effect, um, and, and I guess the, the the debate really is whether it's accountable or unaccountable. Um, you know, it's worth uh, looking at, say, how um, um, uh, indigenous communities around the world. Um, I, I was reading a, a piece in The Guardian by, by an Amazonian chief, and he was talking about how they deal with loggers and miners. Um, and he said, you know, they scout the area, they make sure they know what, what's exactly what's going on, and then they just arrive en masse, burn the buildings, destroy the machinery, tell the workers to flee, to leave, and they just trash the place. Um, similarly, in, in Nigeria, that, that sort of used to happen quite a lot in the Agoni areas, um, in logging areas in British Columbia, um, same sort of thing happens on, on loggers camps. Um, so, you know that that that's the unaccountable side of it. Um, I think the accountable side. Uh, I think the the very good example was um, uh, the British government selling warplanes, Hawk warplanes, to Indonesia, which they could use to uh, take over Timor, East Timor, um, and five um, Christian uh, women. Uh, decided this wasn't on so they broke into the RAF, RAF base with hammers and blood um, and took their hammers to the front of these Hawk fighter planes and um, I don't know you probably know Seize the Day Shannon's, Shannon's song with my hammer I break the chain I will not remain in silence um, they they smashed up these planes, caused millions of pounds worth of da damage with a, a hammer, uh, put blood on the planes, and then rang the air force base and said, "Oi, we're in here. We've just done over your plane." <laughs> um, and uh, obviously they got arrested. And their defence in court was that we are committing a small crime to stop a bigger crime, i.e. the destruction of the Timorese, Timorese people. And a, a British jury found them not guilty. Um, so, you know, that was an example where unaccountable damage, um, uh, sorry, accountable damage was really important. That allowed them to take it to the court get huge amounts of, of publicity and ultimately led to a change in, in government policy. Um, and uh, unaccountable damage, um, well, I, I suppose the sort of obvious example, and I talked a bit about what's going on in British Columbia and, and the Amazon and the Agoni lands in Nigeria, 
uh, probably the 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 sort of the tire extinguishers. Are people feel familiar with the tire extinguishers in Britain and Europe? Tire extinguishers play on fire extinguishers. Uh, so basically, they target four by four Chelsea tanks in urban areas. You know, big polluting cars, um, and um, they just extinguish the tires. Basically, you you arm yourself with a mung bean or a, a lentil if you're that way inclined. Um, and put it in the cap of the the uh, the tire, the wheel cap. Take the cap off, put the mung bean or the lentil in, and then put it back on the wheel. And it very slowly deflates the wheel um, over half an hour. And then you put a a, 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 a le they put a leaflet on the window saying, you know, it's not your you, it's your car. You better make a better car choice. Um, and the, if, if you're on Twitter or Facebook, you should follow the tire extinguishers. But basically, Bristol and Paris and London and Munich have sort of contests to see who can disable the most four by fours in urban areas in an evening. Um, so that's an example uh, of sort of unaccountable um, minor sabotage or damage to them. It's, it's not actually damage to property because all you've got to do is pump it up, but it's bloody inconvenient. Um, and ho also, it hopefully makes those people feel guilty um, because at the moment, so many new vehicles are four by fours. Um, and the last thing is warfare. Um, and, and that's the sort of strategy that governments use. Uh, you know, we're, we're in Britain um, in the last 20 years. Our government has has unleashed a, a hell in Iraq, which has completely screwed up the politics of the Middle East and, and probably will do for many years to come. Um, we bombed Libya, changed the government there, which has left chaos. Um, you know, I, I put that there not because I'm suggesting it's a tactic or strategy we should use, but we have to acknowledge that it's what our government use. And when people talk about you know, oh, just stop oil, they're so violent, or, or reclaim the streets were so violent, they broke a McDonald's window or whatever it is. It's worth just asking those same people, did you support the war in Iraq or Libya or wherever? Because if you did, you know, you're supporting warfare. Um, and by comparison, the the tire extinguishers are, are comparatively mild. Um, so that's a, a very quick uh, run through, really. Um, but uh, and and you know, I, I think the, the future is going to be pretty shit, but we can make it less shit. Um, and, and I think it's also good to remember, whilst at the beginning I talked about sort of negative tipping points as as climatically, there are also positive tipping points. There are positive social tipping points. You know, some things do change very quickly. Um, you know, women got the vote in 20, 30 years of campaigning. GM Foods didn't really come in, and that only took a couple of years to stop that. Um, there are positive tipping points. So I would argue that that whilst change is inevitable, you know, we're heading for hair, some fairly hairy times, but the direction of the change is is not yet decided. And and that's where we as as um people and activists and and have a have have a role to play um but you know i would say we're running out of time i'm i'm you know as phoenix was saying well i think probably many of us have been involved in this for many years um and we feel incredibly frustrated that the chance we had in the 19 <laughs> in the early 1990s with the first ipcc report you know, saying we need to have a 60% cut in global emissions to stave off a two degrees temperature increase. Here we are 40 years later, uh, 30 years later, whatever it is, we've got a 60% worldwide increase in CO2 emissions. Um, so I, I feel pretty guilty that my generation really haven't done enough. Um, and we are leaving a truly horrible, horrible legacy for the next few decades for us, but more importantly, the next generation or two. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to constantly remind myself and us about that, that I don't want to be thinking this in five years and 10 years time that 
we missed the last remaining chance we have by not doing something now. Uh, we know Sir David King's quote from one or two years ago now saying what we do in the next three to four years will probably determine the, the future of humanity. Um, there's no doubt we are looking at an existential threat, i.e. Uh, people won't be able to exist in many parts of the world. It doesn't mean to say the entire species will be wiped out, but it's hard to see uh, the planet supporting seven or eight billion people by the turn of the century. Um, so um, there we are. We've got uh, 15 minutes left. Um, let's have some jokes and uh, questions and comments and that sort of thing. OK, um, yeah, we can run over by five, five, five minutes or so, 10 for one. But uh, absolutely fascinating, Shane. Brilliant. What a what a journey through uh, movements and strategies across many continents. Um, so if you've got a question down at the bottom, there is a reactions uh, little button and you can raise a hand there, which helps us see like that. Who's one, two, three. So if you've got any questions for Shane there, but really absolutely fascinating journey there. You know, um, we need to learn from all previous movements, learn from the past to create the future. And like Shane was saying, you know, we've already made a lot of change with the movements we've been part of. But if they'd listened to what we were saying in the 90s, we would be in a better position now. And we need to focus on the solutions. Uh, I've, next week, we've got Jamie Kelsey Fry talking about global assemblies, oh, and hey. the, um, which is a big solution. Uh, I've put the latest version of the handbook and web links and communication things in the chat there. But has anyone got a uh, um, university panel uh, challenge question there for, for Shane or a comment or feedback? Doesn't this have to be a question? Uh, anybody want to uh, share with the group? Yeah, um, Zoe. Oh, lovely to see you, Zoe. Hi. Hi, just popped in. Hi, Zoe. Sorry, I missed your whole thing. Uh, lovely to see you. Um, yeah, my question, I, I, why I didn't come, uh, we've got Time to wake up Cornwall, very active in our area, and they been expecting to come to the launch of the local climate and ecological emergency hub on Saturday. So I've just been trying to sort of help them all understand who they are and what they're doing and think about strategies. So do you have any top tips? I've been chatting with Indra about this. I know there's an event in Stroud coming up with the movement, which are trying to counter some of the disinfo, like the light these day from stuff like. Um Yes, I mean, so j just to explain, so th this is the sort of the, the fairly new, I wouldn't say movement, but um, people infatuated by 15 minute cities, more recently, ULES uh, attacking net zero. Um, and it, it's sort of a product of Tufton Street and various think tanks and hedge funds. Um, and uh, Indra did a very good talk at the Green Gathering, which is on the Green Gathering YouTube, about their entry into Glastonbury. Um, and, you know, they, they have certainly attracted uh, quite a few sort of what one might call old sort of healthy greens, hippie greens, um, who have sort of swallowed this line, really. Um, I th and I think really sunlight is a disinfectant. I I'd really recommend Byline Times. Adam Biankoff has done some very good research on where these groups come from. Um, but they really are the sort of vanguard of the right wing pushing back against net zero and uh, um, against the movement against fossil fuels. Um, if any of you read Private Eye, there was a very interesting bit in Rotten Boroughs about a, a anti ULES group in Croydon, which is a private group against ULES, where people put um, photos of ULES cameras they've smashed. And you know, Private Eye is reporting the Met was saying about 500 ULES cameras have been smashed around London. They're about 50 grand a pop. Um, the Tory MP was speaking up on their behalf, saying, I think it's a good thing. That the, the, one of the Conservative MPs was saying, you know, he doesn't like, like other groups doing um, this kind of thing, should we say. Um, but then he was complimenting the people who were smashing ULES cam uh, cameras. Well, it, it, it transpired that this Facebook, this closed anti ULES Facebook group in Croydon, the administrator was the uh, the leader of the, Tor the Conservative political party group on Croydon. And an admin was a conservative councillor and his son, who's in the sort of Thatcher youth version, is the other admin. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I have no doubt that the battle lines are being drawn for the next election 
to make climate part of the sort of culture wars, um, as we've seen today with Sunak um, saying yes to Rosebank and delaying electric cars. Um, you know, the Conservatives are trying to row back on their climate promises to make them different to Labour and to appeal to the sort of, well, appeal to people who are frightened of change. OK, uh, we've got a we've got a question there from uh, uh, Mick in Froome and then Helen Hart. One, two, Helen and Leeds. Hi, Shane. Um, very fascinating. You, you've obviously got a lot of history with the uh, protest and... Uh, I'm a bit of a newbie on the block when it comes to that. However, I want to know what next, and you must have been asked this loads of times, what next with uh, JSO, Just Stop Oil? Where they're slow marching. Is that going to go anywhere, or do we have to start doing criminal damage like the suffragettes? Um, and this time they'll be stopping us from having bricks in their pockets. What do you reckon? Ah, uh, yeah, bricklayers beware. Um, and be aware you're being, uh, this is recorded, it goes out later. So well, <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I think there is sort of internal debates going on within JSO, uh, whether to pivot to something that is, not so much meat for the grist for the right wing me media because there's no doubt just stop oil is being weaponized and used by the conservatives and by tufton street to beat labor with and to beat net zero with um so yeah i think there is a question you know if you think when just stop oil started the, the main things they were trying to do was to get the government to agree to no new oil to get more people out on the street um, and to just get word out about it. Um, and they got Labour to change their policy. Labour's policy is still no new North Sea oil and gas, which it was an amazing victory. They have rowed back on that and said that they will honour the contracts that have just been signed on Rosebank and any other ones. Um, but, uh, and then in terms of changing people's minds, um, I wonder whether people's minds now, after a year and a half, are, are getting changed by just up or doing the similar similar sort of things. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, a an internal debate that is going on within just up oil. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, I think the main protagonists there are still very much along the peaceful direct action three and a half percent rule moral high ground um yeah okay i'll leave those brickbats alone <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, following the suffragettes a long tradition there of uh, various forms of action um over to helen yeah i think the one thing that gets me is ever since i've been involved with this sort of thing which is only, only about 10 years it was fracking that brought me out of the woods, woodwork. But Another I, keep thing. He, I keep hearing we need a good narrative. We need a good narrative. We've got to change the narrative. But it never seems to get any further. And I, w I was actually on the bus, oh, six months ago or so, and there was a girl, somehow we got talking on the bus, something happened, you know, and, and there was a girl saying, oh, they're going to bring in these 15-minute cities, uh, cities, and you won't be allowed out of Morley. You'll have to, you'll have to stay where you are, and they're going to use it as a lockdown, like, like lockdown, and we'll all be locked in our area. And I, I said, it's, it's not that. But then I thought... It could be that if we let the Conservatives set it up. So how do we get the story out that a 15-minute city can be good under under socialists and it can be horrendous under, under, under Tories? I don't know, but I, we really need some brainstorming on how to persuade people. I've just been today at um, 
a 16 to 18 year old college, mostly hairdressing, travel and tourism, that sort of thing. And we've just got, how worried about you are you about the climate change? And we had people, these are 16 to 18 year olds, I suppose 16 year olds, we knew, saying, oh yeah, that's about plastic, isn't it? Or, well, it won't affect me in my lifetime. And I'm thinking, you're 16, it will. I'm worried, you know, it is, how do we get that message over? I don't know. And I, I think part, part of the problem is that in terms of the media, um, a, a, a nice green message about how a green lifestyle will be cheaper, more community based, more local, it will taste better. You know, all the positive things we know about sort of living within a, a community and, and how it could be. But that doesn't sell papers. Um, you know, they're much that they're. they're the right wing media and obviously you know 80 percent of the of british media is owned by half a dozen or five offshore based billionaires who really are not interested in the green idea of consuming less uh because people won't advertise with them um so it's a very hard message to get across um but i personally i think through festivals like the green gathering where you know it, it's showing how people can live for four or five days without using any fossil fuels, um, and in a sort of a, a, a common, uh, uncommercially mediated space, um, that it's changed my life. It, that changes people's lives. That gives people a glimpse into how it can be. Um, it's no surprise that the governments brought in, you know the. the various police bills to curtail freedom of assembly to stop people basically getting together without the purpose of consuming um it's fine if you want to consume and you want to pay 50 quid to see a pop star you know you can do that drink expensive beer and then piss off but it, that isn't the sort of the common space that isn't a, a, a an uncommercially mediated space so it's very hard to get that positive point across but mm. oh. uh, you know we just got to keep continuing to point out that, that a green lifestyle will be cheaper friendlier more communitarian but it's very hard to do because it's hard to demonstrate it because we can't get the land to do it in the in the rural areas because it's too expensive if you want to live on it and you can't get the squatted community centers in in the city to provide a roof to do your thing you know when phoenix and me were doing stuff in the 90s we had buildings for four or five years where we were beholden to nobody we were entirely independent and so you know that really was a, a way of introducing you think people to a different way of life and was very powerful and before that the sort of anti-nuclear movement the travelers movement the free festival movement that was all it, very very important to giving people a glimpse into something different but much of that has now been made illegal. Um, very, very good. Uh, I think we should come over to somewhere near Froome for uh, Samantha and then over to Durham for Fiona for University Challenge questions. Um, and uh, hi, it's, actually, it's actually Guy. It's actually Guy. Um, <clears throat> great to see everyone. Um, it's a very small question, really. It's really, there's not nearly enough faces on this screen, you know, uh, everyone should be postage stamps not i shouldn't be able to see their faces um you know so how how do we how do we support people like you that that, that do all the hard graph to, to get things like this further out because it, it you know it's a social media world and we have to just get more people to hear about and be inspired because everyone's so bloody busy and everyone sort of cares a bit but but not enough and we just have to get it out wider so how how do you how do you get out further uh, and how do we support you in that well i guess one thing is that phoenix has recorded this meeting mm -hmm. um so you know that will be available to spread around people um phoenix is doing the these talks once a week um Similarly, the Green Gathering talks that we filmed, which are now on the YouTube, Green Gathering YouTube channel, we're looking at sort of trying to propagate them once every two weeks, have a particular talk, get people watching it together. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, we we live in a, in a, in a world where media that doesn't particularly like us. I think the the, the original hopes for a, an unmediated internet have been screwed over by Facebook's algorithms, and you know, it just makes it harder. It's still possible, but it it, it just makes it harder. Um, and uh, and we yeah we live in busy commercial worlds where we're t we're amusing ourselves to death. We are getting pleasantly distracted to death. I don't. Are know you we... comfortable with 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 invitations like this just being broadcast on on our, our Facebook groups and our friends oh, yeah. and our everywhere? Oh, very much so. Yes. Yeah, and like Shane says, this does go out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram afterwards, and is recorded for for future. We usually get about twenty to forty people for most most Wednesdays and uh, we've got to keep networking like Shane says they're bombarded by information and the mainstream media but you know be the media and let's uh, support and fund good eco projects like climate emergency centers and other ones and Shane's projects and keep it going so over to Fiona in uh, in Durham and then uh, uh, Brigan Loppy in Wiltshire and Zoe in Sunny Cornwall and so just quick plug on Saturday the Truro Climate Emergency Center is opening being opened by the mayor I'll be coming down to uh, visit, hopefully visiting the Plymouth and Totnes climate emergency teams on the way. Over to Fiona in sunny Durham. <laughs> yeah, not sure I can make sense at this time of night. I'm a bit brain tired, but I've sent, I'm sending my daughter to the Truro CEC um, centre opening because she's an organic um, veg grower down in Cornwall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got to bring the family in. Um, yeah, what was I wanting to say? Um, yeah, I think... Lots of stuff goes round and round. Um, we we there's more and more talk about capitalism being the root cause of um, so much of our troubles, including climate change. Um, certainly, uh, ultra capitalism, neoliberal, late stage capitalism, I think is pretty undisputed. It's about profit and endless growth. Um, I I absolutely think there's so much talk about system change that we need to. Uh, stop and think well and and i know there's lots of groups popping up saying how do we talk about climate change we need to be able to tell people what systems we're aiming for um are we talking about post-capitalist systems um i certainly am uh and what do they look like <laughs> i did put um uh an article up just before on the CEC uh, WhatsApp, um, which I think is worth reading. Um, researchers like Jason Hickel are really trying to come up um, with um, workable economic um, solutions that um, obviously they're radical, they're not popular um, with mainstream governments, but I absolutely think we need to move on to talking about it goes it, it goes on from Eleanor what she was talking about narratives we need to move into this realm of well what do we mean by system change uh yeah that's all I'll say because <laughs> my brain's tired as I said very um, good yes go, go, I mean uh, yeah I, I I completely agree with you um and and yeah the, this sort of corporate growth capitalism is is doing terrible terrible damage um yeah. Mm -hmm. Coming yeah. up to Loppy and Brig. Sorry, uh, we're running close on time. Yeah. Fiona, did you want a quick back there? Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, Loppy or Brig, over. Well, I think it's going to be me and then Brig. I was, one of the things besides protesting is to be part of your local ordinary folk community. And uh, climate emergency centres are a really good idea. We've got an eco hub stall so far and charity status. Um, we did. Um, we've been doing classes about energy and that. So we people were coming up to us and asking in the winter and asking for how to save energy, how to keep warm, and all those kind of things are equally important because the less energy people use keeping warm, the less they're causing climate change mm. and it was a kind of service to to particularly old people anyway mm. i particularly liked uh shane talking about the um 
or the tire brigade or whatever they were called. <laughs> tire extinguishers. The tire extinguishers, yes. Yeah. Because it reminded me of a, a time that I did let down both back tires on a police car um, <laughs> at a demonstration of some sort. I won't say where or when, but it was great fun. Um, <laughs> And easily done with a, a couple of matchsticks in those days. Um, <laughs> yes, we've got our eco hub in Salisbury. Um, as Loppy said, we've managed to achieve our charity status. We still haven't found property. Uh, we've been trying to get property off the the city council who actually own some property. Um, without success so far, all they've done is is given us a free stall in the market. So we're using that and doing the best we can and still hoping to find some property eventually. Um, just to say, Brig, very, very, and Loppy, very amazing. Great to see you here. I mean, um, it's legends of the uh, the, the, the Green Gathering um, uh, and, and many previous scenes. But um, just uh, I think there was a younger lady, Eva, in Salisbury, who early chatted about she wants yep. to set up the Repair Cafe and a CC there. And we yep. might have been offered a building. I'd have to check with Linda, but there might have been a building on offer in Salisbury. I'll try and chase up on that one. We have been offered buildings around the country. We're trying to link them up with teams. Uh, um, over. Uh, Lindsay, we're coming close to time, ladies and gentlemen. We usually keep within kind of 10 minutes after the hour or so. But uh, Lindsay, and then we're going to go for kind of checkouts and final comments as we go out. We probably yeah, take a yeah. Lindsay. Uh, yeah, thanks. It's, it's Mike, actually, Lindsay's partner, who's also on the, the council at Glastonbury. Yeah. Jen's yeah. So uh, that's what the point I'd like to make is like... Um, if if you if you can put, go through the agony of sitting through on various committees, do put yourself up for election or co-option at your local parish council, either under the Green Party, the Monster Raving Lunar Party, or whatever. As long as you're representing the the the, the, the new changes that we want to to see happening. And in doing so, you can promote all these good ideas. You can probably even take over the council like we have in Glastonbury. So in effect, the town hall in Glastonbury is our own eco hub. <laughs> and it's not far off it in Froome either, is it, Shane? That's it's right. We've actually made the town hall into an eco hub. And, and um, joking aside, one of the things that parish councils are obliged to do un under statute is to provide allotments if there's, su there's a sufficient demand for them and therefore buy land in order to create allotments. And presently, there are 90,000 on the waiting list for allotments in this country. And now this is a way of, of reclaiming our, our land, our rights, you know, when they were stolen from us during the enclosures, partly. Um, so, although it might sound a little bit like a joke, it's actually real action that can create a positive outcome by joining your local council, either co-opting yourself if there's no elections or putting yourself up for elections in the local Green Party and have these changes come through from a grassroots level. But don't stop protesting at the same time, but have a foot in both camps, like, like you and I, Shane. Yeah, well done. I agree. Brilliant. Um, I think that kind of nicely tops it off. Just, just to say, you know, you've got to try all of the tactics from direct action to, to voting, campaigning, setting up projects. If you can find an empty building and set up a climate emergency centre near you, they are a mothership for hundreds of other projects and campaigns and groups and, and ongoing building climate resilient communities and are actually very successful at building an alliance of groups that comes together. Shall we just quickly nip round the, the screen just to say parting comments or, or goodbyes? Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I think we're actually at 10 past. Anyone who wants to make a quick parting comment? OK, maybe we'll just beam out if people, I think, we're getting. How, how are you doing? Now, Shane, over to Shane. For... Finish, you could just um, tell people where there would be a recording of, of this talk that can be spread around. Um, and Phoenix, thank you for organising it. And thank you for, you know, everybody coming and spending an hour. It's been great. I'm just well, you thank you it's not on the youtube channel it will be up in a, in a, in a day or so uh, on the youtube channel i've just posted again there please do join the telegram or the whatsapp group and comment and set up a cc near you really inspiring brilliant shane thank you so much can i right. can i say on the youtube channel do watch the transition town one it's fabulous Rob Hopkins, a few weeks ago, really yes. inspiring. And I suppose the end plug, therefore, is next week we have the fantastic, the wonderful Jamie Kelsey Fry mm -hmm. talking about global assemblies, the next bigger level 
where you create citizens and people's assemblies at a global level. I think the following on from that, on the 11th, we have uh, Sean Chamberlain, is it, I think, from uh, who wrote The Transition Timeline, one of the second books that came out, The Transition Movement. On the 18th, if you're into raising money, and it was the money crowdfunding expert, Quentin from Impact Hubs is coming on the 18th. And then on the 25th, got a fun-filled month, we have Ed Gemmell, the leader of the New Climate Party, uh, that hopefully will influence mainstream parties to actually bring some climate policies on board, like the Women's uh, Party did. Um, all right, thank you very much for precious yeah. time. Thank you, Shane. Big up yourself. Uh, nice yeah, to see you all. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thanks, Phoenix. Take care, mate. Big up, big up. Legend. Legend of the Lambeth Walk. <laughs> yeah.